Hello, friends. This is Dory Clark, and I am here live with my good friend, Martin Lindstrom. We are here today talking about Martin's new book. It is called The Ministry of Common Sense, and he is going to be sharing with us something that is actually incredibly important, which is how do you overcome the stupid bureaucracy that we <laughs> face so often at work? Uh, so we're going to be diving into that. And as you are here and tuning in, we would love to see actually who is in the audience and joining us. So please feel free to type into the chat box and say hi. Let us know where you're calling in from. Uh, if you're here in the U.S., maybe you have a, a big blizzard going on outside. I know it's snowing out where I am, uh, but we want to hear where you're calling in from and what's going on in your world. Uh, so Martin Lindstrom, so nice to have you here. Dory Clark, I can only say the same. It's wonderful to be here. I have to tell you the crazy story, okay? Listen to this. So here's the story. You know, I'm promoting this book, The Ministry of Common Sense on Amazon, right? Or rather, I try to, because on Amazon, you have this thing where you can advertise for it. Well, the book has now been banned on Amazon. Because what did you story, do? Yeah, <laughs> I'm not kidding. So it says bull S hates. And if you are in doubt about what it means, it stands for bullshit. Just in case someone is in doubt here, right? But I'm using the two words, the two letters B and S. Now, that's that's banned on, on Amazon. Um, but you can still go to Amazon's page and buy the book. You just can't promote the book because the algorithms don't want to allow it. So if you ask me right now, why, do the, why did I write this book? You just got the answer. The book has been attacked by red tape. That is an amazing story. Oh my goodness. Well, I, yes, you know, Martin Lindstrom banned in Boston, banned everywhere. <laughs> this is, this is your, your chance now uh, world. If you, if you want to get the hot banned book, uh, make sure you check out the Ministry of Common Sense. And so we want to greet some of our friends who are here tuning in live with us. We have Juan Felipe from Bogota, Sophie from Richmond, uh, Nelia from Calgary, Margo's here from from Belgium, Khalif from Nigeria, Michal from the Bay Area, Rosinda from Mexico, uh, Carrie is in La La Land where the sun is shining. I know, don't rub your, uh, our face in it here, Carrie. Oh my gosh. Uh, we have uh, Jeannie from, uh, from Oregon and Indrani coming in from Northampton, Massachusetts. We're so glad to have all of you guys joining in. We're going to be taking your questions uh, for Martin Lindstrom, so feel free to type them into the chat box as well. We want to hear from you. Uh, but Martin, a, a big question question that I have, you have now spent several years researching the question of, uh, you know, finding examples about corporate BS and some of the crazy policies. I'm sure all of us have examples in our own mind about companies that we work for now or that we used to work for. Um, but in the course of your research, what are some of the craziest things that stand out? What, what are the policies that just like really don't make sense? <laughs> There's so many about it. So I could write five volumes. But let me just take an experience I had last month when I was jumping on a plane. I was sitting in my seat and over the speakers, there was this announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome on board on this plane. I'm pleased to announce you <laughs> announce that all cabin service has been completely suspended on the entire flight. And then the person continues saying, and if you intend to use the lavatories, the lavatories on the front of the plane have been completely banned for passenger usage. They are now exclusively reserved for the cabin crew. So here I was thinking, I'm sitting at the row three, and I had to pass by 32 other rows, end up in a line as long as TSA, right? And then I can stand there and smell the freshly brewed smell of, of toilet mixed up with aroma of COVID-19, of course. And then I took a seat, okay? And there's a new type of entertainment being introduced on planes. Now, I'm not sure if you have you heard about it. It's crazy. It's called, you know, in the old days you had a landing form. This is the extended version of that. It's called a contact tracing form. It's a wonderful entertainment device. And the first question, and I have a copy of it here, right? The first question is, have you been in close proximity with anyone you don't know over the last 12 hours? And the only thing <laughs> to do was to do this one here and get her name and phone number, right? Of course, for the landing form. And then the second question, this is so crazy. The second question is, well, 
let me just tell you one thing. On planes, we don't wear pens anymore, right? You have an iPad, you don't use pens. So of course, a clever person is borrowing a pen from the purser. This pen is now circulating through the entire plane. I'm passenger number 111. I end up with this pen here, which I can now use to fill up the form. And question two is, and I'm going to read it loud, is have you touched anything anyone else have touched over the last 12 hours? And then I could sort of <laughs> take years to this. So this is this is what's going on in our world. I mean, common sense has left planet Earth. It's just gone. That's it. So I got so furious. I mean, 10 years ago, I started to write down in my little diary all those stupidities going on in organizations and it really happens everywhere it happens inside the corporate doors i'll tell you one story do, do, do you want to have a story more i have I a lot of hear that story tell us you want to you you have this story this is an amazing story so i'm meeting up with this lady she works in one of the largest banks in the united states of america and uh, i had to do the whole smeal here right and <laughs> this is crazy. So she's from compliance. She's the head of compliance, okay? And they're kind of like guard. You, know, you have guard first, and then you have compliance just underneath. Sometimes they take over, but that's not working well sometimes. So I'm going to the 18th floor to meet this, uh, this head of compliance. A wonderful lady, nothing against her. And I'm sort of saying jokingly to her, listen, um, Tell me, do you what, what's your you what's your job? You must have produced a lot of rules, right? I just say this like a joke, right? And she looks at me, and she says, really, not smiling. She says, yes, one thousand two hundred and thirty nine rules. And then I, I must have looked really puzzled. So she takes a manual. Do you remember, Dory? You and I are almost same age. Remember yellow pages, those paper based books, right? I do she indeed. A, you, <laughs> you still have them at home, perhaps. <laughs> So she takes a yellow page-like looking book. That's the manual. Slap it on my lap, okay? And that contains her last masterpiece, okay? And I flick through her masterpiece while she's talking about all these rules, and I land at page 200 and something. And at two pa page 200 and something, there is a rule, and it says, and I'm quoting her, it says, if you have signed a contract with your customer, ensure to email it, ensure to post it, and it's your always to fax it. And I'm looking at her and I'm saying, do you have a fax machine? She looked at me and she said, no, I don't have a fax machine. I said, why do you ask your customers to do that? She said, well, that's not my problem. I said, but why don't you delete all these rules? I mean, some of them aren't relevant anymore. She said, my job is not to delete my work. It is to create work, right? Someone else can be responsible for deleting my work. That was the tipping point for me to write the Ministry of Common Sense. I think you get my, what I mean now, right? We do indeed, Martin. That is amazing. It's an amazing story. And I just want to greet some of the friends who have tuned in here. We have Tracy from Maryland. Angelina is calling in from India. Lorena from Spain. We have Sumit and Zhao Yu from Toronto. Well, you guys are both there. You should be friends. Uh, so that's great. We have uh, Khalif says, I'm excited to have Dory and Martin. I've been following both of you guys' newsletters, and I am an enthusiast. Well, we are so glad to have you. Thanks for Hi, thanks for I us. think I remember your name. Name. I've seen you before. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. If you are enjoying this conversation, please make sure to hit the like button, hit the share button on uh, on your channel that you're watching it so that your friends and colleagues can benefit from it. And I will just mention that if you want to make sure that you never miss one of our weekly Newsweek sessions, go to doryclark.com slash LinkedIn. You can sign up for my LinkedIn newsletter. Just hit the subscribe button underneath my picture and you will get a weekly reminder about the great conversations we have coming up. Next week, uh, we will be interviewing Marshall Goldsmith, who is a mutual friend of both Martin and myself. So we have uh, all kinds of august guests coming up for us. So uh, Martin, and please feel free to type questions, by the way, into the chat box for Martin. Uh, but one thing that I was wondering about, obviously over the past year, everything has gone virtual. It's sort of upended everything with COVID. 
And I'm curious, do you feel like with the shift to virtual, this has been an opportunity for companies in a positive way to reevaluate some of their uh, some of their policies, <laughs> or do you actually see even more mishigas resulting from the shift to virtual? What, what's your take, Dory? I was hoping you would not ask that question. Okay, frankly speaking, so I just got off the call with one of my wonderful clients just five minutes ago, and. I was citing an experience I had yesterday with another one of our clients. And I said to them, how much do you recognize of what I'm saying? You're sitting back to back on Zoom calls or on team calls the entire day. There's not a single break for a toilet. Uh, and if there is, you'll sneak out, you'll put on the you'll put on the mute button, you'll pretend like you're not away because we do not go to toilet year 2021. It's stopped. It's just too impractical, right? So after the whole day of going to, through these calls, you throw yourself at the couch at 8 p.m., exhausted. And what do you do? Now it's work time. This is the moment where we have to do all the work we didn't do during the whole day because we did not have time for it. And by the way, if we are trying to do work during the day, we typically will prepare for the next meeting when we are in the first meeting. So we are not at all present. And that's where we learn phrases like, I agree with you, Mike, that's a good one. Uh, by the way, Dick, send me your deck. Um, it, it has to be the largest deck you have, right? You have these type of phrases you're sort of kind of giving to people. So it looks like you're really engaged. You kind of put this stage nodding here while you're just checking your emails, checking Facebook accounts, whatever, because you're not present at all. Forget about it, right? So here's the issue. Productivity, according to McKinsey, of all people in the world, of course, the cleverest people that just under compliance, right, in terms of who we trust. So what McKinsey is saying is that they actually now are saying that the productivity rate has never been higher in the world. In fact, some numbers are now stating it's not in the billions, it's in the trillions we're saving money. This is just one little detail, and that is creativity levels. It's going down like that because we have no time to think, no time to reflect, no time to interact really or to build a culture. So while we are ticking all the boxes, I will claim that the operation succeeded, but the patient died. And that's really where we are right now. We are in a situation where we are adopting, adapting all the stuff from the good old world of how we're doing meetings in a physical way. And we copy paste it into the new virtual world but I don't think there's anything going back to work. I tend to say there's, we're going forward to work. And because of that, we need to find another way of redesigning our lives. And that means, in my opinion, to do a due diligence and defragment our daily lives and rather having a to-do list, to do an unto-do list and get rid of all these crap we have, which I think most of you guys are sick and tired of. And I just had to ask all of you out there, including you, Kalip, right? I know you're watching. I need to ask you one thing. How many of you feel exhausted by the end of the day these times? I know I do. That's for sure. Welcome in my club. Now we two members. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Feel free to type it in the chat box. Are, are you guys exhausted? As exhausted as me and Martin? Or are we just driving ourselves to distraction? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we entertain ourselves. We're talking every week through this. We can't talk in private anymore. We only do talk in, in public somehow. I don't know why. <laughs> it's true. It's, it's it's the best kind of friendship. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, what's, let's just hop on LinkedIn Live, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm seeing people chime in. Nelia says, yep, she feels tired. Carla says, me, Juan Felipe, I do. Yes, absolutely. Every, everyone's chiming in. I think apparently it is not just us, Martin. So that's uh, that's reassuring. <laughs> Oh my goodness. The, yeah, this is, this is, I think, a really important conversation. And Martin, a, qu a question that I have for you, and, uh, and by the way, thank you all for chiming in. If you have particular questions for Martin, feel free to type them in the chat box. We'd love to hear what is on your mind. Um, and if you're interested, of course, in Martin's book, it is The Ministry of Common Sense. So check that out. Um, but a question that I have, Martin, there's many people who are tuning in who probably work inside an organization. Maybe they're listening. They're like, yes, you are preaching the gospel, Martin. I am all on board. I want to get rid of this crazy, you know, stupid bureaucracy, all this red tape, but my boss won't let me. 
What, what do you advise for someone who is committed to this cause, but has perhaps been stymied in their efforts to try to get rid of this, uh, this dross and dreck that is uh, impacting us in a negative way? Well, Dory, I'm going to tell you a secret right now, but don't tell anyone, okay? You promise me? Just, just between <laughs> heart. Here's the story. So what I tend to do is to go under the radar, okay? Here's the fact. You, here's what's so stupid. When you are doing projects, you always have to do budgets and predictions, but you kind of have no idea about if it works or not, right? So what I would suggest to do is to go under the radar and try to find out what frictions which is frustrating you every day. Now, first of all, ask yourself one simple question. If I, for example, should do a, a little bit of a chart here on the screen right now, and I'll say, this is things which I do every day, and this is things I shouldn't do, right? And here is, is here's the interesting thing. Most of the stuff we do increasingly is down here. That is in do, don't, so that's in don't space, and here you have shouldn't. And here you have should. And what's interesting is this is a space which is really, really crowded these days. And it's crowded because we are replicating what we did in the past into what we're doing today in this new virtual environment. So what I would do is I would ask your colleagues to take photos of the friction points, the things which are frustrating you the most. And there's a lot of stuff going on. Take a photo of it. Why is that? Because if you take a photo, you kind of remember the context. It was that stupid reply. Is that stupid you know, internal website where you can't fill out a travel form? It's all those different things. Take photos. And then if you can't go to work physically, but it's virtually, share all these photos with everyone in your little group, in your division, and find out what they have as a common nominator. And you'll figure out, okay, there is one thing which is re we're all in agreement about that topic. Fine. This is the friction point number one. Here's the second thing you do. You actually ensure to install what I call a 90-day intervention. And let me just explain that for a second. So some years ago, there was an experiment done with chickens. Chickens were put into a cage and they were stuck there for about half a year. And one day the chickens were let out in the beautiful green grass and the sun was shining and the birds were singing. And what happened is the chickens went straight out. And after 30 seconds, they went straight back in again. And I call that the chicken cage syndrome. The reason why the boss, the reason why people in the organization are hesitant to change is because they're kind of afraid of the unknown. And that leads me to the second story of the chicken cage. So imagine that you have four chicken cages seen from the very top. And they're all stacked in such a way that they're pointing in towards a square, right? So here you have the square. Here you have the chicken cages. Right. Here is what you have to do now. What, what I would like you to do is to figure out where do you place a piece of corn to get the chickens out. Now, most people will say to get the chickens out, I place the corn in the very center. Right. But what we've noticed is this. If I'm a chicken here, let's call my chicken A and I'm looking at this corn. I'm saying, my God, that's far away. Uh, my KPIs, they're really not supporting that. And the chicken's going to say, what if my manager is being fired? I'll look like a complete chicken when I'm standing there in the middle of the thing. So what is chicken A going to do? The chicken A is going to look towards chicken B, more clever, more sophisticated. Chicken B is going to look at chicken C. They're all saying, "Me, look at me, look at you, look at me, look at you. And actually, they will end up with all concluding that they will go straight back into the cage and not eat that corn. And this is really what's happening typically in business transformation. So what do you do? Instead of placing the corn out in the center, you place it just outside the chicken cage. And why do you do that? Because if I take that piece of corn, I eat it, it's an amazing piece of corn. All the other chickens will look at it and say, whoa, that's pretty cool. I want to have it too. And you are now having a little success. So when I told you about the idea of creating a 90-day intervention, the idea of having a little friction point and ensure that that friction point is solved. You had to do it in 90 days. Don't do it in half a year. Don't do it in a year. Do it in 90 days. And then this is so important. What you do then is you celebrate the hell out of it. You know, whoa, fantastic, amazing stuff. We changed that little thing. And then you have enough energy within the organization to put out another corn and another corn, and then it's, it's changing. And here's the issue. If we do it that way, we know for a fact today, having tried it thousands of times, that you're actually making a change happening. So that little friction, you turn around to a solution. 
And then you could say to me, what is that solution, right? Oh, and I think that's a fair question if you were to ask that, right? Let me give you a little bit of an, it's okay, I'm giving you an example, Dari. I love it. I feel like this is this is so far the the first and only Newsweek Better show where we've had an extended chicken metaphor, but I am loving it, Martin. Keep it going, man. Fantastic. And then I want a cat metaphor because I saw your cat in the background. So I'm waiting for that, right? Absolutely. So, so, so here it is, okay? What is happening in, let's take a banking world. So I was together with one of my big bankers. Uh, it was a session we had in New York City. We had a workshop, 1,200 bankers, super serious people. The lady from compliance was not there that day, just so you know. We're all sitting there and I asked them, what are you most frustrated about? And they literally paused and then they said emails. And do you know what? An average banker I learned from this session actually received 800 emails a day. 800. So if we do the math of 800 emails, 800 emails is literally the same as 13 hours, 13 hours of email work every day. I mean, and that's where you haven't even been getting your work. It's just looking at emails and replying one minute is, right? So I said to them, would you like to change that? Absolutely. They said, here's a little bit of an interesting thing. Do you know there's a direct correlation between the number of emails you send and the number of emails you receive? Get that one, right? You know where this is going now, right? Don't you? <laughs> 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 so, no, I'm feeling the common <laughs> sense. <laughs> no, I'm still nodding, right? Then I said to them, how many of you are reading these copy in emails, the CC emails, right? Out of a room of 1,200 people, five, I'm not kidding, five people raised their hand, all of them from compliance across. So fine, not. we're going to ban it. We're going to ban this DC button. We're going to ban the reply all button. Oh, we can't do that. One guy from compliance said, and this is where I came in with the 90 days. I said to him, listen, fantastic. I hear what you're saying, but you are one person saying that. Are you looking at all your CC thing? Well, he looked at three the other day. I said, that means the lowest common denominator is going to punish 1,200 people in this room because you coincidentally are looking at a CC thing. Have you ever been sued because you didn't look at it? No. Okay. So why don't we introduce the 90-day intervention? And that's what we did. We got rid. We actually talked to Microsoft. We redesigned Outlook, and we removed the reply all and the CC button. And for three months, 90 days, we ran it. And guess what happened? After 90 days, the number of emails had dropped from 800 to 365 on average. And here's the best thing, not a single complaint was received at compliance. And this is my message. My message is quite often that you have to see the world from a different point of view. And you have to see it from outside in rather than inside out. Meaning inside out, our little world where we drink our Kool-Aid, where it's compliance and BS and all that stuff going on. And I, I like compliance, don't get me wrong, but I love to pick on people, right? Um, so, but here's the issue. If you see it from outside in, which is the idea of seeing it from a customer's point of view, or actually from me as an employer's point of view, which are frustrated and worn down and just tired, then suddenly you'll see a different perspective. So the message is very simple, 90-day interventions, small friction, under the radar, celebrate the success, and then get permission from your boss to move on and place more cons. And now it's time to the cat story from Dory Clark. I love it, Martin. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to, you know, plus one what you're talking about, because actually in my book, Entrepreneurial You, I talk a lot about the power of short sprints. Uh, so I think that's very mm. effective. Um, speaking of cat stories, Anju uh, had a comment in here saying, I hope the window is closed because your cat is by the window. <laughs> Don't worry, Anju, because I live in New York. There's a snowstorm. So definitely the window is closed. So kitty cat is, uh, is safe for sure. <laughs> so Martin, a great question came in from Sumit in Toronto. He wants to know, Martin, what, what would be your common sense perspective on the COVID situation? Do you have advice or tips about managing all of this, you know, <laughs> you know, gesture, you know, hand gesture, all of this uh, from a personal and professional perspective? What's, what's your take on this? Absolutely. Actually, I'm in the middle of the process of writing an update for the New York Times on this very topic. And, and here's the issue. Um, three things. What we learned uh, during this whole process was, of course, 
this is all to do with preparation when you are rolling out the vaccines, let's say. Now, it's not a surprise there's a vaccine coming. I mean, we've been talking about it now for at least a year, but no country actually were preparing for how to roll it out and simulating it. So the first thing we sort of said, no, and I'm writing a lot about is to say, first of all, find out who are the best people to distribute and handle crowd management. And one of the things I would say is, it's the airports. Airports are not even at half capacity. They're at 5% capacity. There's even airports which are completely shut down. Why don't you use them as vaccine centers? Why don't you ensure that that's where we do all the crowd management because they're a perfect environment for that. So that's the first thing. That is to see the world from a different point of view. Actually, one of my suggestions in an article in the Times in London was um, two months ago, in fact, for, for the government to reach out to Amazon. I'm sure they didn't read that, but actually, as you may be aware of, the US government is now working with Amazon on rolling out the vaccine. So that's another take on it. The second thing I would do is, uh, I would ensure that when it comes to this, um, we will get into a phase now where everyone will talk about, have you gotten that vaccine or not, right? And I actually, I would be honest with you, I would introduce a sense of peer pressure. OK, I would say to people, once you've got your vaccine stage one or two, you get a badge, right? And the badge can be flipped around. So on the first one is yellow and it has a magnet and you can sort of flip around and then it's green. And that means I got the vaccine. And I would do that for two reasons. The first reason would be that it sends a signal to all those people who haven't received that you know, vaccine that do you know what? You better step up in case you're considering not to say yes. Um, and the second thing it will do is it will also give us a sense of that we are in this together. It will create a sense of belonging, which I think is really important right now. So, so that will probably be my second advice. Of course, there's a lot of advice. For example, get hold of the retired nurses, which I know we're doing in, in New York City right now. New Jersey is doing it right now, but it's not happening across the country at the moment. I would go out and use different types of aspects of views into this world. So. Can you add common sense to COVID-19? Absolutely, you can. I think it's just a matter about looking at the world from a different point of view, right? That's awesome, Martin. Thank you for sharing your perspective. And just as a reminder for you guys, as we are slowly coming up on our half hour, Martin's amazing new book is The Ministry of Common Sense. Uh, you can check it out and get it anywhere books are sold. He is reachable at martinlindstrom.com and you can learn more about his work. And if you want to make sure you never miss one of our weekly Newsweek sessions, uh, you can subscribe to my newsletter and get more information at doryclark.com. So we have uh, time probably for just maybe one more question, Martin. I, I think this is a great one. Margo was curious. She said, um, oh, sorry, I, I want to get to that one, but actually this is what I wanted to grab. It's from Carrie. She says, Martin, I assume that people pay you as a consultant to help them discover common sense, but how receptive are they to your recommendations? Uh, so I'm, I'm curious if, if you are actually going into companies, how do you get them to say yes if they're these sort of entrenched it's such a simple answer. I pay them. I just I pay them off, right? <laughs> I got to take my salary and give it to them and then problem solved, right? <laughs> no, jokes aside. Do you know what? what? What I've learned is that you need to create an internal movement. And here's the trick. You need to infuse a sense of empathy into people. Uh, here's what's so fascinating. One, one of the things I discovered as I wrote the book was that there is a direct collision between empathy and common sense. Empathy is the ability to put yourself in the shoes of another person. Well, guess what? Common sense consists of the word common, which is seeing the world from other people's point of view. So they are direct correlated. The less common sense you have, actually, the less uh, you actually will see those two words are going down the drain. So let me tell you a little quick story. The story is from a large pharma company, which is the leader in the respiratory field. And um, what happened was that these guys wanted to get closer to the patients. So I said to them, why don't we go into patient homes and try to find out what's going on in, in those homes? And we meet up with this 28-year-old lady, a wonderful lady, and she have had asthma her entire life. And I said to her, how did it feel like to have asthma when you were young? And she starts to cry. And obviously, I hit a, a very sensitive question, a mark here. So I said to her, 
why? What what happened? She said, well, listen, I was teaching school. I had no friends. I was ditched from the parties. Uh, I was a, a clear outsider. I said, well, listen, you look like you have a lot of confidence today. What changed? I said, I'll tell you what it is. And she goes down her back, handbag, right? And she grabs the handbag and she pulls out a straw from the handbag. I said, this one is my secret. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, listen, I usually use this straw and I give it to everyone when I meet them for the first time. And I hold, ask them to hold themselves for the nose and breathe through the straw for one minute. And after 30 seconds, the tubit will spit it out. And I exchange a sense of empathy. Now, during this session, I actually had two executives from the pharma company with me. So I kind of stole that idea. I brought it with me inside this major pharma company. We had a senior management meeting and I switched off the lights. I had the speaker playing the sound of a person with heavy breathing like this, <gasps> that type of feeling. I had uh, everyone installed with a straw in their mouth and then they had to breathe through the straw, holding themselves for the nose. And after 30 seconds, the first guy spits out the straw. He said, this is ridiculous. No one can live like this. And I look him in the eyes and I'm saying to him, listen, this is how your patients feel every minute of their entire life. And they are paying your salary. And if you could have heard a, a penny drop, you would have heard it there. Because suddenly we realized, my God, we're on the wrong track. So they actually are starting to onboard staff differently now using empathy. They're actually designing the products differently using empathy as a centerpiece. They even do the marketing to the healthcare professionals in a different way. So the whole company flipped to become an empathic company where common sense is driving it. And slowly common sense went up and empathy went up. So what I'm doing is I'm using the patients or the customer or the passengers or the consumers as my weapon, so to speak, to infuse empathy into people in the organization so people feel the need for change because a spreadsheet cannot necessarily convince other people. Martin, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. You definitely have some big fans in the audience. Uh, we have uh, we have a great note from Jeannie. She says, time went so fast. Can you have Martin back again soon? <laughs> so <laughs> we would definitely love to do that, Jeannie. And Martin, I hope that we'll have the chance to have you back again soon. Again, the book is The Ministry of Common Sense. You can learn more about Martin at martinlindstrom.com. And if you've enjoyed this conversation, hit the like button and type into the comments your favorite observation or, or the the takeaway that you've learned so that you can solidify it for yourself and also uh, share it with your network so that they can learn. Martin Lindstrom, thank you so much for joining us today. Dory, what a pleasure. Thank you. Take care, everyone. See you next week.